In uh, talking about the aftermath of the 1948 war, I want to remind us uh, that, that one of the biggest issues to come out of the 1948 war is this Palestinian refugee crisis, where three quarters of a million Palestinians were driven out of their homes, or left their homes, or were told to leave their homes by invading Arab armies. And I, we have to be very careful with even that response because it is such a hot political debate. Were they driven out? Did they leave of their own free will? Do they have a right to go back to their homes? This is a, a question that lives on to this day. Because these three quarters of a million Palestinian refugees, they are still, ref most of them are still refugees today. Well, I take that back. Most of them are dead and gone. This was 70 years ago, right? Almost 70 years ago. But they've had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren now that are still living in refugee camps in the West Bank or in, in uh, Gaza or in, in Jordan. And they've, the refugee crisis still goes on for Palestinians. Um, the question is hotly debated within, uh, within Israel even today. Um, new evidence and research that we talked about last class in the 1980s uh, showed that there were instances, at least, there were, there were times when there was actual Israeli forces driving out populations from some uh, cities and engaging in what were known as whisper campaigns uh, to, to scare other Palestinian villages to get people to leave before the Israelis uh, came. But then there were also instances when the incoming Arab armies encouraged Arab popula Palestinian populations to move so they would stay out of the way of the incoming, incoming attack. Regardless of how the refugee crisis began, the refugee crisis is a thing. All right? And the reality is probably the same with the reality of any situation. There's truth in all areas. All right? But I want to mention another refugee crisis that gets far less discussion because it's going to end rather relatively quickly. In every Arab nation of the Middle East, for centuries, there have been Jewish populations. All right? From the beginnings of the Jewish diaspora going back 2,000 years ago, some Jews moved into Iraq, what is today Iraq. Some Jews moved into Jordan, Syria. Some Jews moved into Arabia. You guys remember in the very early history of Islam, you would have talked about an AP world history when Muhammad fled Mecca with his earliest followers, um, and he had... Um, dealings with Jewish tribes in Medina, and there was an issue where, where support was going to be coming from. So there's long been a Jewish population in, in Arabia. There's long been a, a sizable Jewish population in Egypt. Upon this 1948 war, and upon the establishment of a nation of Israel, the Jews in all of those Arab countries, and we're talking, guys, about almost a million people in North Africa and throughout the Middle East, the Jews in all of these predominantly Muslim nations would begin to see a dramatic escalation in persecution against them. And at times, this would escalate to violence. Anti-Jewish protests, anti-Jewish riots. Where eventually, by, by 1949-1950, these historic Jewish populations in many cases didn't feel safe to remain in these communities. And they themselves would be leaving their traditional homeland going back centuries. So this ushers in another refugee crisis, but it doesn't amount to a refugee crisis in the same way that, that the Palestinian refugee crisis does, because Israel will quickly turn around and pass what is called the law of return. And I believe you guys looked at this in your book, right? And if anybody read it, what did uh, the law of return say? Anybody take a look at this? Yes, Sarika. Very good. If you're Jewish, the new nation of Israel will accept you with open arms. So if you are being persecuted and driven out of Iraq or Syria or Jordan or Egypt or Arabia or wherever, if you're Jewish, you can come to live in Israel. And I've got two graphs here, guys, that are important to take note of. This first one is the population of Israel slash Palestine. So what was like the traditional British mandate of Palestine. And we can see the green represents Arab population, the blue represents the Jewish population. So we have a very small Jewish population in relation to the Arab population. 
And then we get into 1941, beginning of World War I, or early years of World War I. Still a vast majority of Arabs compared to Jews. And then we get to 1950, and we see that that Arab population hasn't grown much, right? Some of those Arabs uh, would leave because of the refugee crisis, would end up in Egypt or in Jordan, out of Palestine. But the Jewish population is going to dramatically increase. And a large reason that the Jewish population increases is, one, a lot of Jewish refugees leaving Europe after the Holocaust, and two, hundreds of thousands of Jews leaving other Arab nations and being welcomed back into Israel. So there was a Jewish refugee issue, but it never amounts to a Jewish refugee crisis because Israel accepts them. Israel says, yeah, come live here. Because Israel, trying to establish itself as a nation, wants a bigger Jewish population. And then going forward, going forward from here, we see the Israeli population continue to grow. We see an Israeli population continue to grow in Palestine. Uh, and we will talk about this little drop in, uh, in population. There's going to be another uh, refugee crisis coming after another war in 1967. But then, notice what's happening to the, the uh, Arab population. Birth rates for Arabs are far higher in Palestine than they are for the Jews of Palestine. So their population is growing at a much faster clip. We'll talk about that at a later date. This second graph here, this is just within what becomes the nation of Israel. And at its founding, the nation of Israel, vast majority Jewish. Well, because what happened to all those Arabs that were once within what became the country of Israel? They left or were driven out. This is the 750,000. Notice, if I take those 750,000 uh, Arabs, like in 1941, we've got a million Arabs living in Palestine. In 1949, there's hardly any Arabs. There's about 100,000 or so, 150,000 Arabs left in, in Israel proper. All right? As we press on, we see a dramatic growth in the Jewish population. But what we'll see is declining birth rates for, for the Jews in Palestine, yet a growing Arab population in Israel today, the nation of Israel. The Arab population is growing at a much faster clip. And this is actually supported. <laughs> like, this is seen by the Arabs of, of, of Israel, and the, Arab, the Palestinian Arabs as, hey, this is how we ultimately defeat Israel. It's not necessarily by war, because that's going to be time, t- tried time and time again but by just birth rates. They will eventually outpopulate uh, the, the Israeli population. Um, so anyway, uh, these numbers are, are important to note. I want to make note of this, though, this tiny green line. This would be used as justification by the Israelis to say, no, we weren't ethnic cleansing. If we were ethnic cleansing, there would be no green in Israel. But after the war, there's about 150,000 Palestinian Arabs still living within the new nation of Israel. So some Israelis would say, ah, we weren't ethnically cleansing because there's still an Arab population. If we were ethnically cleansing, either we did a bad job of it, or we weren't doing it. And, and their argument is, it just simply wasn't what we said it was, what, what some have said it was, all right? But we can see there's a dramatic decline in the percentage of pop, uh, Palestinians in Israel. All right? Afterwards, after the war in 1948, Arab nations are going to be in political crisis. Remember that war started in 47 as kind of like a civil conflict between Palestinian Jews and Palestinian Arabs. And in the end, by 1948, by May of 1948, Israel declares its independence and all of Israel's Arab neighbors attack this new nation. Egypt attacks, Lebanon attacks, Syria attacks, Jordan attacks, Iraq attacks. Well, these nations after the war now have to answer to their populace, right? Their citizens were sold a a war to fight in, and they've lost. And when nations lose wars, or certainly lose wars against an upstart Jewish nation in Palestine that was dramatically outnumbered, This is not going to bode well for political leadership in these Arab nations. Arab leaders of all of these states are going to be blamed for that loss in the 1948 war. In Syria, in 1949 alone, 
There's going to be three separate military coups overthrowing Syrian leadership and then replacing it and replacing it again. In the nation of Jordan, the king of Jordan, King Abdullah, remember him? King Abdullah, that was the son of the Sharif of Mecca who was promised Jordan by the British. King Abdullah is going to be assassinated by Palestinian Arabs. Jordan made a deal with Israel. Jordan made a deal with Israel. Hey, we will sign that armistice if we get to keep the West Bank. If we get to keep these regions of the West Bank. So the nation of Jordan under King Abdullah makes a deal with Israel. And Palestinian Arabs in Jordan now are not happy about that. And they kill the king. Yes, sir? Does that mean that they recognize Israel? That, that's a tacit recognition, recognition of the existence of Israel. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So King Abdullah is going to be assassinated. He'll be replaced by his son, a guy named Talal, who doesn't last very long. Um, and he's ultimately overthrown by his own son, a guy named Hussein. This is King Hussein of Jordan. He's going to be an important figure in this story going forward. In Egypt, in Egypt, a strong nationalist movement will rise out of the 1948 war where the Egyptians will be seeking complete independence from British interference. Protests in 1952 result in an overthrowing of the British-supported king of Egypt, a guy named King Farouk. Shortly after that coup in 1954, one of the military officers involved in the coup will rise to power in Egypt. His name is a name we all need to know for our story here. This is Gamal Abdel Nasser. N-A-S-S-E-R. Nasser. He will ascend to the presidency in 1954. He's going to become the president of Egypt. Now this is not any kind of democracy, but the kingdom, the formerly British-supported kingdom, is now gone. Now another post-war reality that, we've, that we're dealing with. And let me go back to a map of Israel, the current Israel. Notice Israel is now smack dab in the heart of Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon. They're surrounded by their Arab neighbors. Arab neighbors that all attacked Israel, right? And we have a Palestinian refugee crisis. Three quarters of a million Palestinians who are now pushed out of their homes, right? While in the years after the war, there will be thousands of what are known as infiltrations, border crossings. Palestinians going across the border for one reason or another. Sometimes it's totally innocuous, like no harm, no foul kind of thing. Like, my house is over that border, and I've left things in there that I want to get back and I want to sneak over the border to get them, and then I'll go back to the refugee camp. Sometimes these infiltrations are violent. A group of infiltrators, Palestinian guerrilla fighters, are going to become known as Fedayeen. F-E-D-A-Y-E-E-N. Fedayeen. These are F-E-D-A-Y-E-E-N. Fedayeen. Palestinian guerrilla fighters who will wage attacks against Israeli positions. Maybe Israeli military, maybe Israeli settlements. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, any, there, it could be coming across from Gaza, it could be coming across from the West Bank. Yep, any, coming in from Jordan proper, whatever. Could be coming from anywhere. It's just a, it, it, there's no organization of the Fedayeen at this point. These are just angry Palestinians who want their land back and want to strike at Israel. And Israel will deal with thousands of these infiltrations. Some of them innocuous, some of them very violent. Israel will quickly adopt a free fire policy towards these Fedayeen incursions or infiltrations. Which means, Israeli border guards, if they see a Fedayeen infiltrator coming across the border... Whether or not they know he's violent or not, they're going to shoot to kill. So the yes. Was just the group of attackers, These are the Palestinian guerrillas going across the border. Yep. Okay. 
So if the Israelis see someone coming across the border, they shoot to kill. This is a free fire policy. Don't go across the border. You'll be shot. And guys, you can't talk about this border issue without thinking about the current American presidential debate, can you? And the discussions over the security of our own border in, in especially the southern part of the United States. So Israel initially adopts this free fire policy. And that does nothing to stem the tide of infiltrations into Israel. So Israel will quickly move to escalate. And they move to a new policy that says, we will now retaliate against the villages. So if you are Fedayeen and you're coming across the border and striking at Israel and we stop you, we will hold your home village responsible. In 1952, pardon me, 1953, in October of 1953, a Fedayeen guerrilla gets across the border from the West Bank into Israel proper throws a grenade into an Israeli house, kills a mother and her two children. In response, the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, it's the Israeli military, launch a raid into the village of that guerrilla. The village was called Kibya, Q-I-B-Y-A. This is known as the Kibya Raid. And this was a revenge raid against this village. And after the Israeli Defense Forces, led by a guy named Ariel Sharon, who's a name, you don't need to write his name down, but just hear it. Because as I've already mentioned, a lot of the names of these early days of the nation of Israel will go on to become leaders of Israel in the future. Ariel Sharon will eventually become Prime Minister of Israel in the early 2000s. Ariel Sharon leads the Defense Forces into Kibya. And they will kill over 60 residents and Jordanian soldiers in this village. This gets prompt condemnation from the United States and the United Nations and the rest of the Arab world. Everybody's saying, whoa, 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 Israel. Whoa, 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 Israel. <laughs> All right, that's what it sounded like. You've got to not do this because that doesn't seem proportionate to what you're dealing with. Proportionality is, is typically a rule of war, right? You know, one border incursion, a couple people killed, Israel responds by rolling tanks into a village? Maybe that's a, that's a little extreme. So Israel starts to get a bad name on a global scene for how they're dealing with this. So they come up with a new plan. Okay, okay, fine. We won't target the villages. But if we get an incursion coming from the West Bank, what country is in charge of the West Bank? Jordan. So we will hold Jordan as a nation responsible. Or if they're coming from Gaza, who's in charge of Gaza? Egypt. So we will now hold the nations responsible. It is Jordan's responsibility to make sure armed insurgents aren't crossing the border into Israel. It is Egypt's responsibility to make sure armed insurgents aren't coming across the border into Israel. And now, if there are infiltrations... Israel will target the militaries of Egypt or Jordan or wherever those infiltrations come from. Do we see how this is escalating into a state-on-state -state conflict? Okay? Cool. Questions, comments, concerns at this point? We've laid out what's going on. We've got a lot more to go, though. All right? Yeah. Yeah. Take it in. All right. Anybody got any questions? The UN just said, shame on you, Israel. You shouldn't do that. But again, what's going on in 19... To have, like, peacekeepers requires soldiers to be sent to Palestine. What's going on in 1953? The Korean War just wrapped up. For, this is fall of 53, so the Korean War just wrapped up in the summer of 53. Um, you've got nuclear arms now in the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, you, you, you don't have any interest from anybody to go fight a war in the Middle East or support one side of a war or another in the Middle East. Now I want to go back to Gamal Abdel Nasser, that leader of Egypt. Nasser does not merely see himself as the leader of an Egyptian nation. 
he wants to be the leader of an Arab united nation. He wants to be seen as a leader of all Arabs, not just Egyptian Arabs. Nasser wants weapons. Yes, ma'am. All Arab, Arabs within Egypt, certainly, but he wants, like, the Arab League, all the Arab nations, like Egypt and Iraq and, and Saudi Arabia and Lebanon. He wants them all to be under his control. He wants to be, like, an Arab Superman in charge of it all, right? He wants everybody to look to him as the leader of the Arab world. But he needs arms so he can grow in strength. And he approaches the United States and says, hey, America, how about you hook Egypt up with some weapons? And the United States, in the midst of the Cold War, says, yeah, we could probably work out a deal. We like friends. But if we're going to give you weapons, they're going to come with American officers attached to them. Like American military, where it's going to go into Egypt and oversee what you're doing with them. While Nasser's an Arab nationalist, he can't just replace the British with Americans now. So Nasser rejects that deal. But he does start taking weapons shipments in from the Soviet Union. And at the same time, the relationship between Egypt and Israel becomes more hostile. Remember, Nasser wants to be seen as a leader of all Arabs, right? Israel, having defeated those Arab nations in war, is now an enemy of Arab nations. So if Nasser becomes a greater enemy to Israel, other Arabs will like Nasser better. So Nasser is going to make a move and shut down Israeli transit through the Suez Canal. And he's not going to recognize the new nation of Israel. And he says that Palestine should be liberated. And the refugees should get to go back to their home. And as he's saying these things and making these speeches, Arabs around the Middle East are like, Yay, Nasser! We like what you're saying. He even moves to shut down what are known as the Straits of Tehran. And I want you to know this body of water, guys. Here's an inset. There's Israel. Suez Canal, Gulf of Aqaba. When the Suez Canal is shut down to Israeli shipping... The only way for Israeli ships to get into the Red Sea is to go through the Gulf of Aqaba. At the opening, at the mouth of the Gulf of Aqaba, is a narrow waterway called the Straits of Tehran. It's going to be very important to our story here. Straits of Tehran are bound by Egypt and Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. Egypt's going to shut down the Straits of Tehran because they can easily put some navy and some guns on the coast here and close down Israeli shipping. Can't get through there. At the same time this is going down, the Israelis suffer another major infiltration in Gaza. Fedayeen infiltrators hop across the border from Gaza into Israel. They shoot and kill an Israeli bicyclist just minding his own business. And Israel will respond in the way that Israel has said they will respond. And how is that? Targeting, not the Arab village, but targeting the Egyptian uh, military. So Israel will launch a retaliatory raid into Gaza. Egyptian police forces and military are killed in this raid. Nasser, angry begins to arm the Fedayeen himself. Nasser begins to start pumping weapons into Fedayeen infiltrators. Nasser is becoming a hero amongst the Palestinian movement. And in 1955, Nasser will permanently blockade the Straits of Tehran. Not any kind of temporary closing now. This is a blockade of the Straits of Tehran in 1955. No more shipping to get through here. Straits of Tehran. And, and the Suez Canal has been, been shut down. Uh, I, 
don't know about that. I don't know how many. Oh, oh, through the Straits of Turan. Um, that I don't know, but I would imagine they would be be fine going through. But I don't know that. At the same time that this is all going down, Nasser wants to build a dam. This is a picture of today's Aswan High Dam in Egypt. Dams are built for a few reasons, sometimes simultaneously. They can control water, like to control flooding. They can create a big reservoir, like a big lake behind it where you can get fresh water. And in fact, guess what the lake is going to be named that is built because of the Aswan High Dam? Lake Nasser, named after the guy that built the dam. And they also create hydroelectric power. Nasser wants to build a big dam to electrify Egypt. He goes for international funding, talks to the Americans. Americans initially are supportive of funding, uh, giving the, uh, the Egyptians some aid. But eventually some American cotton farmers in the, in the south say, whoa, 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 USA. We're going to talk to our congressmen because we don't want money going into Egypt our tax dollars going to Egypt so they can build a dam which is going to allow them to produce more Egyptian cotton, which is going to drive down the price of cotton, which is going to hurt American cotton farmers. It's crazy. Politics is connected to all this, right? So America eventually says, nah, we got no money for you, Egypt. We're not doing this. So Egypt will turn to the greatest resource that they have, and that's the Suez Canal. Egypt and Nasser will nationalize the Suez Canal. Britain is not happy about this. France is not happy about this. It was a French company that was controlling the Suez. And they start to put together plans to get that canal back. Why is the canal so vital for Britain and France? It's how oil makes its way into uh, Western Europe from the Middle East. Uh, I, I can't imagine that. I, no, this was just a, a national, an overtaking of it. It's just gone. At the same time, yes, ma'am. To nationalize it means there's a private company, like uh, any private company that exists. Uh, let's say Ford Motor Company. And for whatever reason, the Ford Motor Company is needed by the federal government to make Weapons of war in the Ford, like let's say during World War II, right? The Ford Motor Company and General Motors were approached by the federal government and the War Productions Board to say, hey, you guys have to start making, instead of making cars for people to buy, you have to make tanks and airplanes and jeeps and all that stuff. And so these, um, these companies would say, no, we're not in business for you, American government, we're in business for our consumers. Well, the American government, if they were to nationalize, would say, okay, you're Factories are no longer your factories. We're taking them over. We're nationalizing this, this company. It is now an American business, and we will use your workers and your factories. Well, wait, that's not cool. That's not how it works in America. True, it's not how it works in America. But why would a government be able to do something like this? What does a government have that Ford Motor Company doesn't? They've got a military. They've got soldiers. So if you've got a military, the company is just like, okay, we've got nothing here. We're, we're leaving. So uh, the Suez Canal is going to be nationalized by Egypt so they can raise money from the ships going through it to support the building of the Aswan High Dam. And Britain and France are mad. One other reason Britain or France is going to be mad at Nasser is, remember, Nasser wants to be seen as like an Arab superman, a leader of Arab nationalists all around the Middle East and North Africa. During the 1950s, Arab nationalists in Algeria are beginning to fight against the French to try to oust the French from Algeria. It's a group called the FLN, if you're familiar with this story at all. Nasser begins to arm the FLN, send in weapons to them. Nasser is making a lot of very powerful enemies. Britain is angry with him, France is angry with him, and of course Israel is angry with him. And they put together a plot, a plan, to overthrow Nasser. This is called, yes ma'am? They love him. They love him. Because he's sticking his thumb up, biting his, biting his thumb, 
Biting is not it's like a Shakespearean insult, right? He, he's, he's, he's flipping the bird to Western powers, right? Saying Egypt should be run by Egyptians. Egyptian assets should be run by Egyptians. What do you guys think? I'm going to stick it to the West. And they're like, yeah, let's do that. In October of 1956, a plan concocted by Britain and France and Israel will be put into effect. It's called the Sevra Protocol. And guys, hang with me here. We're almost done. The Sevra Protocol. S-E-V-R-E-S. Sevra. It's just a suburb of Paris, I believe. Sevra Protocol. Where Israel and Britain and France will concoct a scheme to oust Nasser from power. Now remember, Israel's always dealing with these infiltrations, Right? And Israel has already said what they will do if infiltrated. They'll target the nations that they come from, right? So here's the plan. Israel is going to be attacked by an infiltration. Israel will respond in force by invading into the Sinai Peninsula, attacking Egypt after the infiltration. Britain will tell Israel to stop. Stop this invasion of Egypt. Israel, a part of the plan, will of course refuse to stop. So Britain and France will say, well, we've got to do something about this, and we will send in paratroopers into Egypt under the auspices of stopping the Israeli invasion, but really to regain the canal and oust Nasser from power. What a great plan, right? In October of 1956, the plan goes forward. A Fedayeen incursion, because they happen all the time. An Israeli response. Invasion into the Sinai Peninsula. Invasion into the Sinai Peninsula. Here we have an Israeli invasion into the Sinai Peninsula. Britain and France. Yes, ma'am. 1956. October of 1956. Britain issues an ultimatum for Israel to back out of Egypt. Of course, knowing that the Israelis are not going to back out of Egypt. So Britain and France begin to drop paratroopers into Israel, or pardon me, into Egypt to secure the Suez Canal. And they begin to make a move on Nasser. But nobody told Dwight Eisenhower. Nobody told Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower is furious. Our best friends in the world, France and Britain, have now conspired to launch a war against Egypt and they have not informed us about it. And why would Eisenhower be particularly perturbed in October of 1956? It's an election year. This is like the definition of an October surprise, right? How does it look for Eisenhower that our greatest allies are launching a war in the Middle East without our knowledge? And look good. It's not what he wants to deal with weeks before an election. All right? Eisenhower is not happy. The Soviet Union is not happy. Khrushchev calls for the immediate withdrawal of British and French forces and Israeli forces from Egypt. Khrushchev even threatens to use a nuke. This is just Khrushchev going a little off right here. But Khrushchev threatens to bring nukes. Eisenhower doesn't want this. Khrushchev doesn't want a war here. It's, hey, look, it's an instance in the Cold War where the United States and, and the Soviets actually see eye to eye with each other. Neither of them want this conflict in the Middle East. The United States puts sanctions against Britain. And threatens them against Israel. Britain, France, and Israel all conspiring together. What's that? Brit- British and French paratroopers. Yes. Okay, good. Can't they just go to the United Nations Security Council? Well, who are the five nations on the United Nations Security Council that have veto power? U.S., USSR, China, but now it's Taiwan during this time, France, and Britain. What are we learning about the United Nations and their ability to really do anything in this Cold War era? United Nations is not so united because everybody's got their own self-interest involved here, right? 
It's frustrating, isn't it? Like, as in a perfect world, we would say the United Nations is there. They can solve all the problems. No. Britain has a veto. France has a veto. Italy probably has a lot of people named veto, but they don't have a veto on the Security Council. <laughs> My wife's Italian, so I can make Italian name jokes. Anyway, operations come to an end. Yes, sir? No, Israel didn't do something that Britain... Oh, oh, okay. This is all part of the ruse, the, 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 the plan. Britain and France needed an excuse to go into Egypt. Their excuse was, Israel attacks Egypt. Hey, you Israel, stop. Even though we know you're doing this because it's all part of the plan. Israel will refuse to stop. So Britain and France have to swoop into Egypt under the auspices of stopping the conflict, but really wanting to take the canal. It's all a scam. So ultimately, the United States threatens sanctions, the Soviet Union threatens nukes, and the operations in uh, the Suez Crisis, is known as the Suez Crisis, they cease. Israel is going to hold on to a chunk of the Sinai Peninsula. They blow up an Egyptian highway to, uh, to slow down any future advance into Israel. Ike tells Israel, you got to get out of the Sinai Peninsula. you got to leave this territory. Golda Meir, a foreign minister for Israel, later a prime minister of Israel, says, Israel will pull out, but under this condition, and you guys need to listen to this one, because this is what they call in like literature, foreshadowing. All right? If the Straits of Tehran are ever shut down again, if the Straits of Tehran are ever shut down again, that will be what's called a causus belli. C-A-U-S-U-S, belly, B-E-L-L-I, a cause for war. Israel will consider any closure of the Straits of Tehran in the future an act of war. C-A-U-S-U-S, causus, belly, B-E-L-L-I. So guess what is going to happen in 11 years? Egypt is going to close the Straits of Tehran. Israel is going to see that as an act of war. That's a 67 war, yep, the Six Day War. The results of this Suez Crisis, dramatically changing the diplomatic scene in the Middle East. Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, is now an Arab superman that he was always going for. He is now seen as an Arab leader that not only defied the Western nations, the Western powers, but defeated them. Because believe you me, even though Britain and France weren't defeated by Israel, or by, by Egypt, pardon me, they went into Egypt and they left. They left because the Americans kind of said, you got to get out. And the Soviets said, you got to get out. But Nasser is going to say, this was us, this was me that drove them out. Yay, me. And he becomes a hero in the Arab world. In 1958, in 1958, Egypt and Syria will join together and create what is known as the United Arab Republic. A united country, a new nation, essentially. Remember, Nasser wanted to unite all of the Arab world. United Arab Republic, the UAR, it does not exist anymore. It doesn't last for very long. But Egypt and Syria will join into a common nation with who is the leader, ultimately? Nasser is the leader. If you are Israel... Are you threatened by this new nation? You better believe you're threatened by this new nation. Kevin? So did Egypt keep control of the Suez Canal after this? Yes, Egypt gets the Suez Canal back. It is their canal now. Yep. And it's going to be closed to Israeli shipping. That, that's not... Israel can't force Egypt to open up the Suez Canal. But they can say the Straits of Tehran is an international waterway. You've got to leave that open. The British and the French, totally discredited in the Middle East. They're out. In the absence of the British and the French, who had long had control in the Middle East, who's going to swoop in? The U.S. and the Soviet Union, looking for influence. 
This is during the Cold War. The United States was really concerned about the spreading of communism and the spreading of Soviet influence. So President Eisenhower, here he is again, President Eisenhower will issue the Eisenhower Doctrine, which says, hey guys, you know what we said about the Truman Doctrine? Where like, we'll support any nation that is being threatened by outside interference, like a communist takeover? That applies to the Middle East as well. The Eisenhower Doctrine pushes the idea of the Truman Doctrine to the Middle East. Don't go getting greedy in the Middle East, Soviet Union, because we will support any nation in the Middle East with military force if it's being threatened by outsiders. The United States will also, upon insisting on Israel leaving the Sinai Peninsula, the United States will also call for international peacekeepers to be placed in the Sinai along the border of Israel and Egypt. This is going to be called the United Nations Emergency Force. The UNEF. These are blue-hatted United Nations keep peacekeepers who will go to the border between Egypt and Israel to keep the peace. The United Nations Emergency Force. But they're going to go to Egypt. Israel doesn't want them. They're going to go into Egypt. And here's another little bit of foreshadowing. They only get to be in Egypt so long as Egypt wants them in Egypt. And as soon as Nasser wants them to leave, they have to leave. What do you think is going to happen at one point in the future? Nasser's going to ask for them to leave. But a United, for the time being, a UN emergency force is going to be put along the border of Egypt and Israel. So what do you think will happen to like, the number of infiltrations across the border? dramatically decrease, right? And that's where we will leave it today.